And since then, uh, Vadim Petrovich was uh, related to me in different capacities. As a next door uh, lab chief, as a boss of my boss, as my boss, as a co-author, but always as a friend. And I don't know anybody in the position of Vadim Petrovich who can knock at the door of the office and come in any time, not to the reception room with the secretaries and people who are waiting to be received, but immediately to his desk. And I think that that's why it uh, happens, because uh, he believes, I think, that also, of course, in the administrative hierarchy, postdoc and uh, director of the institute or the dean are very much in different position, but in science we are all equal. And that is what I'm trying to implement in relation to my students and students of my students. And that is why Vladimir Petrovich is always open to new science, not necessarily in his narrow field. And that is why I would like to tell you today about new emerging science, which emerged recently. That's about extracellular vesicles. And each instruction says that in the beginning of the talk, you should state about conflict of interest. And I must declare I have no conflict of interest because this show doesn't pay neither me nor to my studies. Today I'll tell you about extracellular vesicles. Uh, recently, that's right, please. Oops, it's my fault. Uh, for many years, my lab studied HIV pathogenesis and pathogenesis of other viruses. And recently, I think a drama is developing in our field, not only in HIV field, but the whole virology. Because what we thought we dealt with, in this case HIV, is not HIV. It's always a mixture of viruses with extracellular vesicles, which sometimes called exosomes. These extracellular vesicles are generated not only by infected cells, but also by uninfected cells. And basically, they play an important role in physiology. Uh, this idea of the extracellular vesicles is they deliver something to the cell, not in this way, like you throw a bottle in the ocean and hope that somebody whom it's addressed will fish it out, but rather in an addressed way. So ex these exosomes are addressed to particular cells. And <clears throat> also, for people who are outside of this field, there are hundreds, dozens of uh, papers and uh, reviews published, and to some people it's already clear that extracellular vesicles are generated in one cell, they take cargo out of the cell and deliver it in an addressed way to another cell. Unfortunately, most of these statements were not proven yet or proven in a very artificial way in ex vivo system. And I wouldn't go into problems, but I address you to our review, which we recently published, was at the end of last year, where we discuss all the problems of this concept. Field is emerging, is explosion. Every week there are at least 100 papers published about extracellular vesicles, and they follow the last number I took from PubMed yesterday night. So 400 papers, it's only about extracellular vesicles as a title or as a keyword. There are many probably which I have missed. Moreover, it's more and more people found new extracellular vesicles, not necessarily vesicles, new particles of uh, extracellular vesicles of different size. That the whole world, I think, new world is found nowadays, and it resembles me really when Levin Gook looked in his microscope and found hundreds of microorganisms, of which he even today not know about every organism what he's doing, uh, so many hundred years later. I hope that science is accelerating and will know soon about the function of these vesicles. But these vesicles really constitute a new world in biology. Uh, if you ask who discovered this extracellular vesicle, because science, this paper immediately starts people thinking when they discovered who get different prizes, 
And there is no answer to this, because every student who looked in the microscope on the cell culture saw some dust floating around. And for many years, this was considered as a dust. And nobody, of course, gave uh, funding for people who studied dust. And of course, nature laughed, uh, laughed at us, because nature doesn't have dust. Everything in nature is used for something. So I think there are two founders of our field. One is Darwin, and the other is William Shakespeare, because Darwin really wrote about these small particles, which take cargo, and uh, Shakespeare in Macbeth also told about <coughs> bubbles, which we call now extracellular vesicles. These vesicles are now uh, in play a function in a very different field. And immune activation, which are late to aging, which I have no time to discuss, in pregnancy, in viral infection, in cancer, in the microbiota, which is the most important probably part of today's studies about pathogenesis, mental health, de including depression, autism, and even marine biology. So if today you don't like my talk, that means you have such a wrong composition of extra vesicles, extracellular vesicles in your blood, you just need to correct it. So what is the function, a really proven function of extracellular vesicles? First of all, in immunology, because now if you ask immunologists, how the immune response developed, and asked many prominent immunologists, they say, oh, it's easy. You have some three cells, this, this, and this, to come together. But I, from being a former mathematician, I know the three particles can never meet together in nature, and uh, only in little experiments. So now it's more or less clear that you don't need three or more cells, because the cells can send extracellular vesicles to another cell and signal this, and the other cell thinks that is really extracellular vesicles, a piece of membrane, and gives some uh, immunogenic response, as in this slide. Uh, moreover, it can activate other cells. Instead of dendritic cells, it can send extracellular vesicles and uh, activate immune response. Or T Rex, which suppresses immune response, also can be substituted in in vitro experiments by extracellular vesicles. Moreover, we recently uh, found that cytokines, a classical, classical soluble factors which regulate immune response, can be found also in extracellular vesicles. And that solves, in my mind, one of the problems of how these extracellular vesicles are addressed. What is the address? Because cytokines can be on the surface of these extracellular vesicles, and uh, they attach only to cells which have appropriate receptor for these extracellular vesicles. Uh, when I talk to my uh, mathematical friend, bioinformatic friend, and tell them in a popular way what is the system, the system of cell-cell communication, they say that every system in communication have whatever, human, cell, animals, have one feature, which is called redundancy. That means by one or, or several features of this message, you can guess with some probability what is inside. So like in human communication, if one of us receives this envelope, one Russian, one American example, you may be sure not opening this envelope, that's not a love letter, and it's not a letter from your aunt who asks you about your health. You already guess what is there, not very pleasant. So the same thing is about extracellular vesicles proof, because extracellular vesicles from one cell, there is some dependency of the cover of this vesicle, so the membrane, and what we found inside the cargo. Moreover, here we found that microRNA, which is now the most studied cargo of these vesicles, really uh, depends on the uh, surface markers of these vesicles. That means that that's sent by the very same cell. So it has all the features of cell, cell of communication between in the series of communication. So, do these extracellular vesicles and come to my main field of research affect viral infection, in that case, HIV infection? So normally, yes, there are papers that it's done. There is a very well-known paper of uh, Jörg Sadowski in, from Pittsburgh who showed that resistance to viral infection uh, of trophoblast and trophoblast uh, naturally defend the uh, embryo from being infected, and they're resistant to many viruses. 
you can transfer this resistance from trophoblast to the cells which were initially sensitive to this infection, just taking extracellular vesicles. And here I identified some microRNA, RNA, which really delivers this resistance. Uh, moreover, uh, there are data about uh, the role of these extracellular vesicles in, uh, in HIV infection. They activate T cells, that may be related to aging. Uh, they suppress apoptosis, so the viral infected cells produce virus longer. They downregulate MHC1 and MHC2 and some receptors, which make the cell evade immune response and hide from the immune response. We know that now one of the most important fields of studies is microbiota. That's bacteria which live in our body and some believe regulate almost everything, starting from our mood to uh, depression to all physiological answers. So what we do, some of us know, when we move to a foreign country. The first thing you should learn, of course, is the language of this country. And that's what bacteria uh, really learned when they move to our body. They produce, in this very recent discovery, extracellular vesicles, and we don't know how it is produced because some gram-positive bacteria has a sick wall, but nevertheless, they produce these extracellular vesicles, and they communicate with the host cells with the same language as the host cells understand. In my lab, we recently started to study vaginal microbiota, which is very important, because this microbiota protects women from different pathogen infection, in particular HIV. It is known from many uh, epidemiological studies that lactobacilli protect women from HIV infection, and we uh, managed to reproduce this in our ex vivo system. We, we put ex tissue, cervicovaginal tissue, as an explant, which preserves its site architecture for a couple of weeks, and infected it with HIV, and also put lactobacillus was isolated from uh, vaginal fluid on this system. And when you put lactobacillus, HIV is significantly suppressed infection. And most recently, in December, we published a paper which we found that you don't need the whole lactobacilli. It's enough to take extracellular vesicles from lactobacilli, put in the system, and these extracellular vesicles uh, they uh, protect uh, the tissue from HIV infection almost the same way as a whole bacteria. We know uh, the uh, mechanism of this phenomena because lactobacilli, we didn't know whether lac with extracellular vesicle affect tissue or virus. And I was, uh, my intuition said that it probably affects tissue, which is of course a pessimistic view because in tissue and cells, as we all know, you cannot understand anything. But fortunately, I was wrong, and these extracellular vesicles affect virus itself. It doesn't affect tissue or cells. And we know how it affects, because uh, you can, uh, after extracellular vesicles interact with this uh, with virus, there is a main protein, N, which mediates fusion and infection of this virus. You cannot access it with uh, antibodies. Easily it change its conformation, or somehow damaged. That's what we call the NH translational medicine because it's clear what you can do next. But do EVs contribute, the host EVs, to HIV infection? In normal science, you can do regular experiments, which you taught to the students. You take an experiment, mixture of extracellular vesicles and uh, the virus, and do two controls one just pure virus, another pure vesicles. Unfortunately, this crazy science which we study, it's not possible because you cannot really distinguish between this change ex between extracellular vesicles and virus when isolated because they go the same pathway inside the cell, <coughs> they're the same size, <coughs> the same physical chemi chemical properties. It's almost impossible to isolate one from another. So what we used, we developed a technology to study single extracellular vesicles and study antigenicity, we use magnetic nanoparticles, which are bound to antibodies of 10, 15 nanometers. So they bound only to extracellular vesicles or virus of our interest. And then we can state 
these extracellular vesicles with one or two antibodies, fluorescent, and with mag powerful magnets to separate these extracellular vesicles from antibodies. And we hope that by these antigens, we can understand the difference, at least analytically, of vesicles from virus. But unfortunately, it was not that easy, because in the literature, 320 proteins, which both extracellular vesicles and viruses take from the cell, when they bat from the cell. And most of them are common, so you cannot really understand when you state whether it's vesicle or virus. But fortunately, not all of them are common. There are at least two uh, proteins which differentiate virus from vesicles. That is acetyl cholinesterase in CD45, which for some reason is not incorporated in virus, but only in vesicles. So we did uh, flow cytometry when using this tissue, and we uh, managed to separate with magnetic nanoparticles at least part of extracellular vesicles from HIV suspension, and found that without these vesicles, there is suppression, partial suppression, of HIV infection. So in that case, they help. But then we decided to study what is inside extracellular vesicles. And for this, we take magnetic nanoparticles the same way as I told you, and uh, put uh, antibodies which are common for vesicles and virus, and this way you fish both, but then analytically with uh, different antibodies, you can understand who is vesicle and who is virus. And we, to our surprise, we stained this uh, system with antibodies against M, GP120 is a viral protein which I mentioned, which mediate infection, and we found that one of them which has CD45, doesn't have CD5 lower part, right corner, is virus because it doesn't have CD5, at least most of them. But those with CD5 are for sure vesicles. And these vesicles, as you see here, are positive for viral protein, the very same viral protein which mediates infection. Moreover, you can change this experiment and take those magnetic particles with anti m And in this way, you don't even pick up these viruses, and you see again that these vesicles carry most important protein of HIV. And the same we found about CMV in another system, cytomegalovirus, also uh, vesicles produced in cytomegalovirus infected system also carry important CMV surface protein. So what is HIV or any viral preparation? It consists of the virus with uh, vesicles which carry viral protein, and pro probably with vesicles which carry not viral protein, something else which, for which we are blind. So what is virus? What is extracellular vesicles then? I think the difference is now semantic, because in the old virologist, old I mean middle of the last century, 1950s, 60s, if you look in the Webster dictionary, there is very well defined, as mathematician I believe in definitions, very well defined um, word term virus. Virus is a, a small particles which can uh, replicate only inside cells. But we lost this definition because we use the term non-infectious virus, defective virus. Moreover, in the HIV field, 99, some say 99.9% viruses, viral particles which generated in the infected body are defective. They don't go in the next round of infection. Infection continues with 0.1 or 1% of viruses. So who is virus, who is, who is vesicles? Uh, several, a couple of years ago, we, pre we um, published a review in PNS where we, now it's, uh, this uh, diagram is well cited and shown that we think there is no viruses of vesicles. This is a gradient uh, continuum from uh, vesicles, which are generated independent of infection by uninfected cells on one extreme, to viral particles infection in one extreme, but there are all intermediates in between. And for me, it was really a revelation. Now I look at the whole field of virology with different eyes. It's like in old times, in times of Newton and Gurgens, we looked in the visible light and see different colors. But now, with the development of physics, we know that that visible color is a small, small part of the whole spectrum of magnetic um, waves which is very small on the whole uh, scale of magnetic field. 
So I think that virology is now approximately this size of uh, what spectrum studies of particles which have a very wide spectrum. So, of course, there is an evolutionary uh, question what came first? Viruses learned from vesicles or vesicles learned from viruses? I'm not much interested in this. There are many jokes which uh, you can translate in English. There was a Soviet joke in Russian. Когда ничего не было, спрашивает дедушка, мальчик, что было раньше, яйцо или курица? Он отвечает, до революции все было. Everything was available before. So, uh, I would like to finish with summarize, and I have a good timing, uh, what I told you about. First of all, that all cells, they generate vesicles. Both infectious and not infectious. Vesicles affect HIV infection, and vesicles which are generated by microbiota, bacteria, in uh, vaginal microbiota, they suppress HIV transmission. And what we thought is virus is, in fact, is a mixture of viral particles, vesicles, and some of these vesicles are not distinguished by viruses because they carry the same proteins, and some people show that RNA. So analysis of individual proteins on the surface of individual vesicles may become, of course, a powerful tool for studying physical function and hopefully, hopefully, it's a hope, may lead to the development of new diagnostic and therapeutic strategies. It's hope, but I like uh, what uh, Sir Francis Beckham write about, wrote about hope. Hope is a good breakfast, but is a bad supper. I hope that we, in our field of development, we're still somewhere in a lunch time and we still can keep this hope. I started you with the literature, with uh, Shakespeare. So when I was uh, young and still now, I liked poetry of William Blake, which in a translation of Russian poet Marshak sounds в одно мгновение видеть вечность, огромный мир зерней песка, в единой горсти бесконечности, небо в чашечке цветка. So I always wonder why Blake took a grain of sand as this allegory, because it's grain of sand is very uh, boring thing. It's, it has very uh, dull structure, and it doesn't reflect, in my mind, all the complexity of the world. I think if Blake would write this now, he would write about extracellular vesicles, in which really the whole world come together, both immunology, which, cardiology, microbiology, uh, gynecology, oncology, virology, and all fields. So all of you who think they don't study extracellular vesicles, you do study extracellular vesicles in your experiments, Maybe you don't know this, but extracellular vesicles in your experiments definitely play an important role. So what everything what I told you about was generated in my lab in National Institute of Child Health and Human Development by Roger Spalamina, Anusha Rekelian, Wendy Fitzgerald, Christoph Van Puy, Jean-Charles Grivet, Sonia Cicoli, and Christoph Van Puy. Of course, with collaboration with our important collaborators, Bob Gala in Institute of Human Virology, and Nestor Nota Van Hoen in Utrecht <coughs> University. Thank you very much. <laughs> I finished five minutes before my deadline. Time for uh, questions, so thank you very much for such a nice presentation. Yeah, please. Uh, simple question. Should we add so-called micro-vesicles to the elements of what? I mean, you know, the erythrocytes, lymphocytes, and other structure of what? So that's a new structure of blood, just for analysis and so on. And the second short question, perhaps you give us the picture. What is the physical structure of these microvesicles? I mean, the size, of, is it a double membrane count? It's something like proteal liposomes? Yes. The first question, no, we don't need to add anything because we already have it in our blood and we study this in a context of cardiovascular disease, which uh, they have important function in this. The size uh, are very wide, but the majority is the size of the virus. That's approximately 120, 200 nanometers. That's why it's difficult to separ separate it from uh, most of RNA viruses. The structure is exactly like piece of the membrane, mostly outer membrane, which uh, encapsulate with proteins, lipids, which encapsulate some cargo, cellular proteins, RNA, sometimes DNA, 
it's not clear how it happens. And uh, then I hold field of the science about mitochondria of the cell vesicles, which people study, which generate by mitochondria. It's not clear, some people know, but I don't know. What is the function of these mitochondria vesicles? Is it, is it a water supply? Just yes, yes. Water and yes. Is, how, what's the size of this space? What you can carry by that? Yes. So it's, since it's a wide range of vesicles, let's say 200 nanometers, so take by layer out, and you see what is the volume inside. It can carry significant proteins, cytokines, RNA, pieces of DNA, and that was shown in many studies now. Okay, uh, maybe I'll ask a question. So, uh, because we discuss here aging, I just, could, could you comment on the role of EVs uh, in, in aging? For example, one could potentially take, um, uh, like, exosomes from a young animal and maybe deliver to the old and maybe get some help in disease and aging. Uh, I don't know such experiments. I doubt about this. But its relation to, to, to aging is through immune response because immune, uh, improper immune activation now lies as a basic of all, almost all human diseases. It has two buttons. One is uh, etiological aging, known or unknown, another improper immune activation. And extracellular vesicles play a very significant role of immune activation, the way I showed you. So these experiments may be reasonable, but for people who study aging and what we heard earlier about blood transfusion, that may be related. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Mm -hmm.